here we are getting ready to talk um, SWOT. And what's really amazing, and as I've talked to people, gentlemen and lady, um, when I say, what's the show about Friday? And I say, SWAT. <laughs> and I get one of those, oh, yeah, yeah, I know what that is. And so, you know, then I, I help people through it. And, and I believe that that's going to be a little bit of the case today. And I think when we're done, we're going to convert a whole bunch of people to appreciate the power and the value of doing a strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threat on your business. But first, when a car's engine or transmission fails, it's not the end of the road, a remanufactured drivetrain product from Jasper Engines and Transmissions will give your customer's car a new lease on life. And oh, I did say I was here on Rainbow Boulevard in Las Vegas, but I'm at Frank Scandura's place, Frank's European. I've done an interview with Frank, saw all his great pictures, but there's nothing like being here to see yeah. this incredibly beautiful place. Have you been here, Murray? Yes, uh, I have. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. That is wife, awesome his, his kids, just a just a beautiful place. So yeah. thank you for the bandwidth, Frank. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So a SWAT. A SWAT is, uh, is in, in my mind, everyone, it's an opportunity to almost create a mini strategic plan for your business. And, you know, people don't quite know. If you've never been to a strategic plan at the corporate level like I have, <laughs> this is a piece of cake. <laughs> this is a piece of cake. And a SWAT um, – is this, and here's how you have to approach a SWAT. You gotta be honest and real. You have to be constructive while telling the truth. You have to put your feet in someone else's shoes and you have to be open-minded and think outside the box. So with that as an opening, Greg, I wanna ask you the first question. So sure. why would you do a SWAT on your business? Well, the question is why wouldn't you? Um, it is one of the most simple, best tools that you could use to evaluate where you're at. And just like you said, it's, it's, it's kind of getting naked, looking in the mirror going, okay, what do I need to work on? What's looking pretty good, which, you know, at our age may not be as much, but uh, <laughs> it, it really is an, an eye opening thing. Um, and as you and I talked about at dinner, including your employees, because they're going to have a different view than what we have. And so what things we may see as the owner or the, the manager of the company, may not be the same as a technician sees or a service advisor sees or a, a general service technician sees. And so um, that's one thing I've already taken away from our discussion at dinner is not only doing it on a corporate level, but, but bringing it all the way through the ranks. It was almost like you and I at dinner. We, we went through the whole seminar. Right. And right. we said, well, okay. <laughs> we, we rehearsed. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer because – I've done this even not only in, in the business units that I ran and or worked in, I actually have done it for independent businesses. I was hired to come in and, and I so firmly believe in an outsider. Uh, I all, first of all, I don't believe that the owner of the business should do the SWAT if you're doing it with your people. Now, if you're going to sit home in the, in the home office and, and put your thinking cap on and, and build your SWAT grid, Okay, and, and you know, some of the stuff mm -hmm. I'm going to put up on the website so you'll all have it so you get an idea of what we're talking about. This is what a SWAT looks like when, when you think about doing it with a 3M sticky paper. I was talking to someone, they said, yeah, we'll put it up on a whiteboard. And I said, no, you never put it up on a whiteboard. You put it up on paper with the sticky back. And mm -hmm. you know where that goes? It goes into the owner's office on the wall because you wouldn't have gone through the exercise if you didn't want to stop and look at it and then start recording from it. Well, I'll take a picture of it. It's not like, it's, there's, no, there's nothing like having that up on the wall. And I think by the time we get done with our discussion, people will realize that some of these tactics in doing a SWAT are so powerful and so value. And, and you know, we, we were talking, Greg, involve your people. Owner sits on the side, doesn't say anything. Independent person facilitates, pulls it all out, and the entire team. Now, it doesn't need to, you don't need to have the third level in the org chart, but it could really be helpful because sure. when you listen to your people, and because they, they have gems of wisdom, as we all know, that um, they're just willing to, ooh, ooh, I want to be involved. So that's a great thing. Thanks, Greg. Murray, um, what do you tell your clients? 
you're a business coach. You know, I forgot to introduce everyone. Uh, see, I, I'm, I'm out of sync here. Rick yeah. Bunch is from Aspen Auto Clinic and Transformers Mastermind. Marianne Croce from Croce's Transmissions and smallbizvantage.com. And Murray Voth is from Freedom Consulting and Training. Glad to have you all here again. Uh, Murray, what do you tell your clients as a business coach on the value of doing a SWAT? Well, a summary sentence that I start with is by telling people, why don't we control the things that we can control so that we can deal with the things that we can't control? Hmm. So, for example, when I had my shop back in the day, my service station, I had a coach, um, went to uh, 20 group meetings and learned how to do better. My early years, of course, were very activity-based, late nights, long days, as a lot of you know when you first start out. and oh, yeah. You take the training, you take the coaching, and you begin to put <laughs> systems, processes, and people in place. And um, we had one of our kids get a, a, a childhood disease that uh, they've grown out of, thank goodness, and wow. thank our prayers. But I couldn't imagine have, having to go to children's hospital for all those appointments when – I would have had a shop to run the way I did in the old days. I was able to come and go, you know, I don't like to use the word as I please, but as I needed to. And so we can't control health necessarily like a thing like that, but I can control the systems and processes. So, you know, I don't always start with an emotional example like that with everybody, but hey, I'm on live on Facebook. Why not start with a great example, right? Right. And uh, so that's how I start off with people and then go into the tool of the SWOT analysis and uh, work at so of the four things what do we have control over what do we do not and I analyze it from that standpoint besides all the great ways that you guys are going to talk about and have talked about already uh, good stuff I, I listen uh, everyone I'm privy to all these talking points and I have to tell you this is going to be a great great Academy seminar Marianne is a SWOT an analysis tool yes it is it's a great tool and it sounds more complicated than it really is. Mm. It's not that difficult to do. Mm-hmm. And it's, I, I always found it, and this is going to sound crazy, actually fun. <laughs> oh, no, I agree with you. You get so much out of it and that you have these light bulb moments. I think um, to tag on to what you were saying, the owner doing a SWAT themselves is, okay, it's one perspective. What can happen with that is if the owner is just doing it themselves is it's just their version. They're they're not getting input from anyone else. But I think to your point, a lot of times and many other people that have been in coaching have noticed this. When you give people a tool, the implementation part can be very difficult if the owner doesn't buy in. No matter what, you know, whether you're training a service writer or you're training a team, if the owner doesn't buy in. So part of me says we need to start with the owner for them to see the value of it because you can bring the team in or you can have other people do it. But if they're not going to buy in and implement, then that that could be a hurdle. You're right. You, I think you actually nailed it. I mean, we could probably hang up right now. And I think <laughs> it, truly if the owner yeah. isn't ready to, to react to what is up on the SWAT chart, assign responsibilities and timelines, prioritize them. <laughs> it was just an exercise to say that we all had coffee together. Right. <laughs> and, and, and you're absolutely yeah. right. Uh, I love the independent facilitator who has got the dynamics, business sense, and who could pull stuff out of people. And that's one of the things that I always enjoyed in doing an SWOT because you have to ask the question sometimes, well, what do you mean by that? An owner is going to know what they mean by that. But a facilitator is going to say, what do you know? But what do you mean by that? And the owner and the person is going to go deeper. And every once in a while, what happens is, is the tactics of the strategy start coming out during the SWAT. I mean, oh, we need to do this. Well, why do we need to do this? Why is that important? And, and, and it starts bubbling to the top. So there, there's a great advantage with a person who doesn't live in the same house not to do it. Right. Now, I would encourage, Greg, everyone, and I, just go out and find a buddy and a friend. You know, Anybody who comes in from the outside into a business is always an expert, right? Right. <laughs> always an expert. So, Greg, are you, are you volunteering, Carm? I am. Absolutely. <laughs> God, I mean, it, are you kidding me? I, I love to do SWOTs with teams. I just, just love it because it, what, what ends up happening in, and what I've seen from people's eyes is uh, they, they become so involved. And then what happens is they go home and says, 
what are we going to do first? What are we going to do first? I can't believe we're going to fix this. I can't believe we're going to, we're going to, we're going to go into that area. You know, they may, may, you know, shops may be thinking about, let's do another bit of service off or something. Right. And we're going to buy some new equipment and we're going to, we're going to tackle this. Those are dreams that start becoming reality. You know, I think we live in an industry that uh, can be, can be fairly negative. Um, You know, you got, technicians and aren't always happy and you got customers that aren't always happy. And, um, and so really analyzing the strength side of things can be refreshing to go, you know what, we really do have a good customer base. We really do have good employees. We really do have good things going on within the business because, you know, there's days that we feel like, man, everything is going wrong. So getting a good picture of what your strengths are, writing them down, um, and something I began to talk about is is how that applies to our marketing, both for our technicians, our service advisors, managers that we may need, and new customers. <clears throat> you know what what are it, it kind of can blend into that differentiating thing or things that are in your business um, that that may not be in your competitor's business. You know, everybody advertises we hire ASC certified technicians. Everybody has a warranty. You know, most people have a shuttle service, but what are some things that go above and beyond that? And to me, extracting those things out of the S, the strength part of this analysis um, is the beginning of that discussion with, and and I believe just like you said, that's a discussion with your employees. What, you know, why do you guys work here? What, why do you think our customers come here? What, what things do they tell you at the counter? Wow. I love that you guys have a clean waiting room. I love that you guys have a shuttle. I love that you stand behind your warranty. Um, I love that I get to meet the technician, whatever those things are. And every business is going to be different, but that strength piece of it can pull those, extract those things out um, and and bring them to life. That's a great point. Now Mm -hmm. you just brought up a a great piece. You you said the word shuttle and could shuttle be on the strength side, Greg, and on the weakness side? Oh, absolutely. We've uh, probably had three accidents in our shuttles. <laughs> so uh, that goes to uh, what threats, right? Uh, yeah, that, that, this, but here, my point was is that you could have the strengths could be that we have loners. Mm-hmm. Weaknesses could be we don't have enough. Mm, okay. No, the I'm, threats I'm thinking, could be the, the threats. I'm thinking about the liability, right? No, no, um, exactly right. Yeah. I know a shop owner that, you know, went through a three year lawsuit on, you know, they loaned out a car. I'm, and we do have loaners too, but. Um, he got the license, he got her insurance. Well, she got drunk or was high on drugs, uh, crashed the car, hurt somebody else. And you know, the, ins- the lawyers wanted to go after him saying, well, she had a suspended license. And he's like, well, she presented one. Right. And we took a copy of it. They did everything right. But, um, you know, we, I think you've talked about it in some of your stuff before with loaner cars. Do you put them in a separate LLC? Do you make a part of your company? But, um, and I think that goes into sometimes we don't know what we don't know and why we need to be talking about these things because somewhere some shop owner out there is going to go, Oh my gosh, I never thought about that being a mm-hmm. threat. What can I do to mitigate that? Murray, anything on strengths to uh, help guide our listeners? <laughs> well, I want to tag on to what Greg was saying. Um, and I love hearing that whole idea of what are the, you know, the negative side of the business, the positive side of the business. And, uh, he said it really, really well. And one of the things that I've helped some shops do and did with my employees in the past was realize what we have, like really committed to what we have, what do we have to offer the customer and having that engagement with them so that when they come to work in the morning, they know what their why is. I mean, right. I think all of you have probably heard about Simon Sinek and his start with why. Uh, I think I was asking why when I was three and got in trouble for it fairly often. I'm that kind <laughs> of a person. And um, so the idea is, what is your why? We're getting up in the morning. And the other part, just expand, I think, on Greg said it well, but just expand a little more, is when you talk about marketing, um, you know, to me, people ask me, you know, hey, what about this marketing, advertising? And people are hung up on advertising and coupons and gimmicks and stuff like that in our industry. And it drives me insane. Uh, that stuff comes off your bottom line. And I always tell people, you know, marketing is a modern concept. I researched it. It only came out in the 50s. Wow. So, yeah, it was to mark, you know what it was? It's to sell widgets that we made too many widgets in a factory. So we created a marketing department to sell the extra widgets that we made, hmm. right? Things that maybe people needed or didn't need. But I always tell people, think about 1,200, 1,300, you know, go to Cornwall, England, and go to the farmer's market on Saturday, the market. How did you come to market? Why would you buy your tomatoes from one guy 
versus another woman versus another person. Somebody says, well, I would buy the cheapest price. Other people say, you know what, I would buy the cleanest tomatoes. The other ones would say, well, I would buy the tomatoes that had the best flavor, right? So the whole concept of marketing is how do you come to market? So you guys need to brag about what you have to your customers. That's different than advertising. That's just sharing. Hey, listen, when you come to our shop, this is how we look after you. And we love right. looking after you that way, right? Great so wise just, words. You know, Great wise words. Wow, thank you for clearing up that ad man thing here. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 maybe now I understand the show. Um, to add to what uh, both of the gentlemen were saying was, it also gives you a different perspective when you look at all of those things. You see your position in the marketplace, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is huge because your team sees that too, yeah. mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. overall big picture, yes. like where do we yeah. stand? So I tend to take that SWOT analysis and also do that as well. I mean, you can do that on a simple XY graph mm -hmm. and see where your position is yeah. in the marketplace. Let's understand one thing. I think it's a perfect time to stop and say this. You can do a SWOT on your finances, mm -hmm. on marketing, on operations, on safety. Greg, these were your talking points. Right, right. Inventory systems, real estate. Literally, you can have your own little mini strategic plan on all those areas of your business. Well, part of, um, part of what I'm going to be doing with Transformers is uh, helping people that want to how, go multi-store and to me it starts with that foundational evaluation okay where are we at now you know uh, yeah. going through those exercises what are strengths what are weaknesses you know what does the staffing look like what does the marketing look like what does the accounting look like you know and and when you know a guy can have a very successful single location and wants to go to multi-store uh, you know maybe he's doing the marketing he's doing the accounting <clears throat> um, maybe his wife's involved in that and so um, at what point do you have to say, okay, I'm going to have to create a job description. I'm going to have to train somebody. I'm going to have to delegate that because if you're going to grow, uh, you have to delegate. And so having those systems and processes in place are really, really important to, to a growth strategy. And that all can start with the SWOT analysis. Let's move into opportunities. And again, let's just look at it from a customer perspective or a, a revenue perspective. Anyone want to take that? Yeah, I'd be happy to take that. So when you're looking at the opportunities in your business, you can look at this in so many different areas. Is it looking at numbers and saying, what's our most profitable service? Is it looking at a new revenue stream for your business? Is it looking at your team skill set, you know, and saying, wow, what do we need to, to do this? Is it more training in a certain area? Is it equipment? And really go in and diving deep to nail down what it is that you need to make that opportunity happen. And also trends. You start seeing and reading up on trends and where the industry is going, and you see that opportunity in your shop. So the idea is to be proactive instead of, you know, reactive. Right. Not watching it just go by you, right? <laughs> yeah, many, unfortunately, in our industry um, did not keep up with technology. And I'm sure we all know people that the industry did end up passing them by. So is SWAT's an opportunity to stop and smell the roses or smell the dandelions. But you have at this moment in time that you could stop, take a picture of what's going on in your mind in your business and in the marketplace. Greg, I absolutely love uh, your uh, gift or curse about being a visionary and how opportunity right. fits in there. <laughs> so my, uh, my corporate office, we have a conference room and if you open up the shades, it's uh, I 25, which is, you know, our, our main highway artery through Colorado. So there's, you need to stand there for two or three minutes and watch hundreds of cars drive by. And so I go, well, there's no shortage of opportunity. Let's take a look out the window. See all those cars? Those are all our opportunities. But no, in, in seriously, um, you know, having different ways of looking at the business, you know, uh, doing glass repair, um, you know, just add-ons, those are all opportunities that we have. I mean, and I, I throw out more opportunities to my staff um, than they can handle because I just, I see it everywhere. I see opportunity everywhere. Um, you know, fleet work and, and all different kinds of programs that can be put in place. And they, you know, they're, they're working to keep up with me. Um, but it also, it, it can be energizing to your team that, that, that you do see the opportunities and, and what opportunities do they see? 
um, because that's exciting. I mean, that, that gives us a hope in a future when we see that we do have these opportunities instead of all oh, the, the dealerships getting stronger or another competitor can get built a store or, you know, all these things that can be seen as a negatives go, wait a minute, guys, what are, what are opportunities and how do we capture them? Excellent. I'm going to pause for a second and say that Jasper has over 2000 associates, three manufacturing facilities, two distribution centers and 45 branch offices across the country. They're all working to produce transport and deliver the perfect product. And that's what they do best. Keep customers happy. Uh, SWOT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Now, weaknesses, you got to face them. They exist. And there's so many areas today that actually are threats from the outside that could come in and they're weaknesses for us. And I think of this whole cybersecurity thing, and we're not here to nail down any one thing specific. But the reason I said that is I think it helps our audience realize what a weakness would be. I never want to admit that we're weak in any area. Right. We're good. And I'd love to talk a little bit about weaknesses, team. Well, you look at our, our business industry, and I see it changing slowly, but I still think it comes with a real macho culture. Like you said, you alluded to that, Carm, that, uh, you know, I don't have any weaknesses. I got this under control. We don't want our customers to see us uh, as weak. We don't want our employees to see us as weak. Um, so then we end up micromanaging. Right. We, we micromanage our employees. We micromanage all the situations. We end up being the go to person. And what I found working with the group members and, and my clients is I for a lot of us sort of automotive types, we get addicted to adrenaline and not adrenaline from good sources. We get it to addicted to the adrenaline of putting fires out all day. Mm. You know, you actually feel good being the fireman. And then the other psychological part is, is because you're the go to guy. Right. Everybody comes to you to solve all the problems. That goes to your ego. Right. And so that sort of builds this mindset that you don't have any weaknesses and you're the person to go to. And sometimes when I've worked in groups of owners together, and I find that's a really good dynamic is to start with them together in a room safe with their peers, right? No employees, no customers, no family, just a bunch of shop owners together. And they understand. They'll actually write down in that box, me, I'm the weakness mm-hmm. of the company. Man, is that a breakthrough when yeah, somebody is, admits Absolutely. that. And then we can build. We can work on that. And I, I think that's probably one of the biggest struggles that I try and help people with is, is you have to kind of remove yourself from being the, the hub that all the spokes come out of. You know, a, a lot of shop mm-hmm. owners, you know, they got yeah. three or four employees and they're the main service advisor. They're the main technician. And if they go down, the company goes down. Mm-hmm. Uh, they haven't kind of built any kind of insulation around them. Um, and it, it's one of, to me, uh, to overcome a weakness of, of being short staffed is growing to be a bigger company so that, you know, if you have one guy that sells service and he gets hit by the proverbial bus, whatever that is, you're in trouble, right? If you just have one technician or two technicians and one of them gets recruited or gets hit by that proverbial bus, you're in real trouble. So, um, it, it's, it's really to, to turn that weakness into a strength, you have to have a certain size of company in order for that to work. Um, and you just hear a lot of people that they're too much of a control freak to, to grow their company because just like you said, they're, they're the man or woman and they're not willing to give that up. And it really creates a, a dangerous situation when it comes to being in business. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ego is, in a lot of cases, ego, I find, for a shop owner, starts out as pride because mm. many start out as technicians. So they are doing great work. And many people have even told them, wow, you should open up your own shop because of that. <laughs> so it starts out as pride, but pride, there's a fine line between pride and ego. And when it turns into ego, that's where the growth stops. So, you know, uh, to both of your points, when you know that as an owner, and you realize that it's like once that light bulb moment happens and then you can grow and you can go further with that. The, I think the technician mindset, you know, just to clarify, there's nothing wrong with it. It's production in a shop and it's a huge part of a shop and we need that way of thinking and we need that, you know, wanting to take pride and do quality and work. But I think when you become a shop owner, the biggest transformation that has to take place is you need to think like a business owner 
And mm -hmm. I know in my shop, I came from banking. My husband was a technician. He will tell you that that was the biggest challenge and the biggest journey because he him saw himself as a technician who now owns a shop. Right. I saw myself as a businesswoman that owns a shop. So the business side of you, business owner side of you, has to take care of all the pillars in your business, not just production. Right. So I think it's a journey, but you know, I tell people it doesn't have to leave battle scars. <laughs> I was going to say your husband is one of the luckiest men in the world to have had you on board, Tony. <laughs> oh, Tony. I am lucky too. I, I am lucky too. <laughs> oh, great so, guy, Tony. Uh, I want I want to put a shameless plug out there, uh, and and if any insurance agent wants to send me a check, that's fine. But I'm not getting any commission. But uh, two things. One is in 2012, we had a fire in the shop and it didn't burn the building down, uh, but it, it completely <clears throat> filled. We have about a 10,000 square foot building. It completely filled it with just the nastiest plastic, oily uh, ash, took out the computers. Uh, they had to take all the drywall out, put new uh, insulation in, repaint top to bottom, scrub top to bottom, replace all the lifts on that side of the shop. I mean, it it was, it ended up being, and this is where I'm going to go with it, a three quarter of a million dollar claim. And that's because I had business continuation insurance. So yeah. if you don't get anything else out of this, write that mm -hmm. word down and make sure that you have that because now we were fortunate. We had other um, stores that we could send our technicians and our uh, customers to, but you know, we were down six weeks. Can you imagine if you were down six weeks with no income, mm -hmm. no way to pay your employees, no way to pay your rent? That would have taken most people out. And so paying the difference for yeah. business continuation insurance saved my business um, in, a, in a huge way. And the other thing I just uh, signed, I don't know, last week is cybersecurity insurance. Um, we had a, okay. a phishing, you yeah. can read it on my blog uh, on Transformers, but we just had a, uh, uh, a guy pretending he was me send to my CFO and said, pretended it was me and wrote in and said, hey, I need you to... Uh, initiate this wire transfer. Here's the account number. We need, I need you to move $28,000 over. And they thought it was for me. And so he sent it to our bookkeeper and said, Hey, can you talk to Greg about this? Thank God they sent it to me, find out more. And I'm like, wait, 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 don't, that's not me. Look at the, look at the email address. Um, but, yeah. and I don't know if that would be covered by a, by cyber security or not, but um, you know, like you said in the beginning, Carm, that is a weakness that a lot of us don't, we don't even, we're ignorant. We don't even know what's, what can happen out there. And I think that oppor the opportunity to do an SWOT on your business and dig deep, this isn't a half hour exercise. No. Guys. This is no. a two or three hours sometime. And taking and, uh, an expert like an IT, right? None of us yeah. are IT experts. Mm -hmm. Having exactly. them come in and do a yeah. SWOT on, do our, SWAT, uh, yeah, IT. on our IT. One of the things that I wanted to add, um, when, once the owners say, yes, I'm the weakness, then we can go back to, so what are the strengths that you bring, right? So build mm -hmm. them back up again and then look for areas of opportunity sure. in them. So one of the biggest things I find in people that are technicians that own a shop is lack of leadership skill or training or background. I, all right. And so that's you're one of the biggest opportunities uh, Murray, to create leadership. You're yeah. reading my mind. Let me <laughs> tell you just what I was thinking when Mary Ann was on. I wrote down, ego starts out as pride. Mm. I've heard that before. Marianne, you may have said that before, but I, I continue to just love that sentence. And then I wrote down on another slip of paper, the words leadership training. Mm. And I was figuring out how could that pride in the ego get fixed. And it, to me, reminds me of leadership training. So I, I'm going to ask all three of you this question. And we may be branched out a little bit here, but I think it's a perfect time to talk about it. How do you approach your clients and say, all right, you got to get some leadership training. Are you doing leadership training? Are you recommending books, tapes, series? Does the client appreciate at the end of leadership training, training what it may have done for him? Let me hear you. Well, um, I guess we're, we're all waiting <laughs> for who's going to go first. Go ahead, Greg. Um, so I remember sitting on my bed years ago. I had two stores. I was drowning. I was struggling. Things were an absolute mess. And I read uh, John Maxwell, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. And I remember reading the story about the law of the lid. And he was talking about uh, Ray Kroc and how the McDonald's brothers hit their lid in leadership. And it took Ray Kroc to come in. And I know he's controversial, right? But 
that the point was that he was able to take that business way farther than the McDonald's brothers ever would be able to. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, that is me. I have got to learn to raise my lid. Um, and, and I would say just like as I became a master technician, most of what I did was self-taught. You know, I didn't go to a trade school. I, I, I tried to glean information from, you know, back then books, tapes, uh, other technicians in the shop, whatever, whatever resource I could find um, to build a foundation. And so that's kind of how I've had to, to go through. Um, you know, I've been in different 20 groups and I've been to different things and, and you kind of glean uh, parts and pieces from, from all those things and develop your own leadership style. Um, but it's important. I think, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I can recommend it yet cause I'm still reading it, but I brought my leadership book. Um, and I try and try and read one every couple months and, and get different perspectives on it. I just read one on servant leadership, uh, a couple weeks ago that was phenomenal. And I'm like, all right, that's, that's going out to all my managers. That's going out to my crew. That's going, I'm going to send a copy to all my uh, people in my mastermind group because it was one of the most simple, best books on leadership that I'd ever read. Um, and I'm a big, big believer that the servant leadership model is the way to go. But, um, you know, I, I don't think there's any one place you can just go, okay, I learned, I went to that leadership class. Now I'm a good leader. It's an, it's an ongoing process, just like being a good technician, being a good business owner. But a lot of us, you know, have to decide, Hey, my business is only going to grow to the point of my ability to lead it. And if I don't, if I don't improve my skills as a leader, my business is going to stagnate and then you lose good people because good people want new opportunities. Does it take a business coach like you three to, um, to influence someone to become a better leader? Murray? Yeah, I think it does. It brings an outside perspective. Um, I think in the case of all three of us, we've had experience in the trenches, you know, pretty good solid couple of decades in there and we've been through the the valley <laughs> and then we've had people help us right um you'd need an outside perspective an outside look at things one of the things that um i really enjoy doing when it comes to the leadership conversation and again reading books i completely agree i probably read something at least every week I'm, i've got a couple books open somewhere as, but some of it is perspective change. So one of the one areas that I work with with my clients is, um, you know, in our sort of Western democratic style of culture, you know, a shop owner from our backgrounds, tech, usually technical background, the way that we, you know, lead our team is to lead by example. Well, we think leading by example is to show them how fast to do a break job or to mm. be in the shop helping them, cleaning up at the end of the day, maybe, you know, supporting them on the front counter. These are not wrong things to do. But I have found that, you know, owners will come to me and say, my people aren't following me. They're not doing their job. And I look at them, I'll say, well, you're not doing your job. And they're looking like, what do you mean I'm not doing my job? Mm. I'm, you know, all the cars are fixed. And I said, yeah, but um, where's your accounts receivable? Where's your accounts payable? Um, have you done a SWAT? Where's your, uh, where's your business plan for the next year? And they're looking at me like, that's leadership. And I'm like, that's doing your job. Mm -hmm. If you think of Columbus, 1492, they believed the world was flat. If you fail, if you sail too far, it was pretty disastrous according to their belief system. So how easy was it to get sailors? They got them from bars and jails, apparently is what, what I've mm -hmm. read. So think about a sailor on a ship going west with Columbus going, we don't know where we're going. We could right. go off the end of the earth. <laughs> and so if Columbus is below having a nap, they're like, don't let Columbus sleep. He's got to be up top watching. <laughs> wow. He's the only one that knows where we're going, right? So we have to be up in the crow's nest watching where we're going. And that's leadership. That's doing our job. And then people will be happy to be taxed. They'll be happy to be advisors because they know that that's their role in the company. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with everything that you're, you're, all of you are saying. The other thing I just wanted to add on with leadership is I don't think that um, you find leaders it just in roles of authority or, you know, depending on your rank in a company. I think you find mm -hmm. leaders in every position. Right. And I think that's something important to keep in mind because when someone does take responsibility and accountability and they really own that role, um, it's, it's just amazing. I had a a, um, I always say the story of Joe, but I had a college kid that we had hired to be our, you know, shop assistant, shuttle driver for a summer. And this kid was an amazing leader. He, he truly was the definition of a leader because he owned that role and he got really creative with it. And the 
real definition of a leader to me is is helping others succeed. So when you want your technicians to succeed, what you do is you empower them to succeed. Right. Give them what they need, but then step away and don't micromanage. Same thing with a service writer, same thing with everyone else. So I think to dispel that myth that only an owner can be a leader, um, you know, I just wanted to add that in. No, that's great, Marianne. <laughs> yeah, thank 100%. you so much for going down this little rabbit hole of leadership mm-hmm. for me. And, and I think you, 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 did, you did great. And by the way, John Maxwell was the first book that really set me off to mm. re- realizing uh, I knew I had to be a better leader. I picked up Developing the Leader Within You. And it would be that book that I gave to many people. I bought and gave to many people. And then when 21 <clears throat> uh, Irrefutable Laws of Leadership came out, that ended up becoming the Bible for me. So right. thank you for bringing that up, Craig. Now let's talk about threats. That was the last SWOT that we have not covered. And again, I open the floor. Well, one of the threats that we're <laughs> facing all over North America, uh, Canada and the United States, is the shortage of qualified technicians. Um, if I go around the rooms of the people that I work with, I would say 50% of them are looking for either an apprentice or a journey technician. Right. Uh, so that is a threat from one perspective. And so the idea of, um, again, back to my opening, what do we have control over? So we identify that it's a threat. Uh, it's been a threat for seven, eight years already, if not even longer, uh, seeing this coming down the pipe. Schools aren't promoting it. Uh, guidance counselors aren't promoting it. Uh, parents are looking at sending their kids into fintech because that's where all the big money is, right? Um, you know, kids going into technology, not understanding how technical cars are. Huge is actually a culture shift, right? The idea of somebody loving cars and going into fixing them, um, you know, is, is something that I think needs to change. Now, Carm, one of the things that I, I do when I do the SWAT is, okay, so here's a threat, but it's always a mirror image, all of these boxes mirror image themselves. So a threat is also an opportunity. Right. And so what I've had the opportunity and the privilege of doing is either bringing what I already know or researching further, you know, best practices in, in marketing and advertising for people, best practices in, in how to interview people and identify uh, the key players that you need. And uh, one of the things that I'm learning is the, and this is maybe not the right word, but I'm going to use it because it's one that comes to mind. The shops that are run in the strictest fashion, like with great quality control, great leadership, um, they all have a technician in their back pocket. I've got a half a dozen guys across uh, across Canada that have somebody waiting to work for them in this dire shortage. Why? Because they want to work for a shop that holds everybody accountable to quality, the customer, their why. And so right now there's not an opening but they're waiting for there to be an opening. So I'm finding that you can actually turn that threat into an opportunity by changing your operational and your shop culture and your hiring practices and actually attract the best. And just a quick side note is then get involved in the community. We've got a group of shop owners are now all going to present to the guidance counselors in the high schools in their marketplace, right? This take control over the situation, do what you can do, right? That's great. <clears throat> you know, uh, even though there's a there's literally a labor sor- shortage uh, across the country, construction, trucking, automotive, plumbers, electricians, IT people. I mean, it's uh, it, it's an interesting dilemma coming out of the Great Recession. Of you know, there's it's pretty hard not to be employed if you if you want to be employed at this day and age. But um, you know, there's still people lining up around the block to work for Google, right? So why do they want that? Because they have such a reputation of being an awesome company to work for and the benefits and the, and the culture and the environment. So setting ourselves apart uh, via culture benefits, those kind of things, like you said, Murray, um, it, it's got to, it, you can't run an ad like you, you can't even run an ad for a lube tech. I mean, I remember you'd put an ad on Craigslist and get 60 applicants and you had to shut your ad off in two hours. Now you get two or three. Um, and it's mm-hmm. probably the same two or three as you got last time you ran an ad. So it's a, <laughs> it's a new world. Um, and being the best employer has to be on our strategic plan. Yes. And again, <clears throat> asking our, asking our employees, why do you work here? Why, why don't you work at the competition? Um, what, yeah. what is it that, that keeps you here? Um, Miriam, before you comment on threats, uh, this was just a great dialogue, Murray and Greg, and I couldn't help but think that the tech shortage could fit in every box. Mm-hmm. 
it really could because um, a strength could be that we're a great company people want to work for, but why aren't they coming to work? It ends up opening your eyes to areas you have to work on. Mm -hmm. You may not be as good as you think you are. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that the, the, the tech shortage could be in every box that, you know, as, as I, as I think quickly about it. So don't be afraid to, to, to stop and ask yourself the question, tech shortage, where does it go on the SWAT? Think through it, and mm -hmm. you may just find that, oh, that's an A priority in every box. We've got to do something about it. A plug for last week's show, Academy 39, was on how to build your bench and recruitment. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of a cool thing. Oh, we have to work on that. We'll go listen to one of Carm's Academies, and we'll see what that's about. Marianne, threats. So the, the tech shortage is something that we can all um, relate to. We, we know it's throughout the industry. And to touch on your point, um, I have many people that I know that are in all types of trade industries, and they see it as well. And I think there's a couple of different components to that. One of them is, is our customers. If our customers come in and don't value what we do, they are parents, they are teachers, they are guidance counselors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are influenced by that. And then they will not, you know, when someone turns around and says, hey, mom or dad, this is what I'd like to do. And they get that kind of funny look on their face like, you know, what would you want to do that for? But right. if they value the industry and they value what people are doing on their one-on-one -on -one experience, they may have a different view. Also, our industry, unfortunately, for the last, you know, couple of generations, we do have a negative image. And I think it's up to the responsibility of the owner of the shop to create that culture and to be seen as the professionals as they are. And I think a SWOT analysis can really help you with that to say, we want to go beyond just the four walls of our shop. We want to be seen as professionals, leaders in this industry. And then the third component of it is, you know, the teaching aspect, having people that really have a passion for what they do and love you know, bringing the young people in and getting them excited. I mean, young people are all into technology, so we can't miss the boat. We can't make that disconnect if we're not into the technology right. and sharing, you know, benchmarks that these kids are making in the schools, sharing them. So I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. and so much can come out of this SWOT analysis, to your point, Carm, that can be in a threat area, but we also can turn around and see all of the opportunity um, that a shop has to get out and, uh, you know, be seen and really be a resource to the community. Well, we could go on for a couple hours. I know it. But uh, what we're going to count on is some really good show notes on the show notes page. And I'm going to put up the, uh, Marianne, I think you have a link to something on your site. So if any of you guys have something that you would be willing to share, send them to me. We'll put it up on the show notes. And I'm going to give you a last word right now. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at SWAT in, in a, you know, total comprehensive look. But one more time, as let me summarize my, my piece of this. Strengths are, is what we do well. And if you, if you start out with that, then, you know, the, the whole mindset of your team can go many places. Weaknesses, what could we do better? Threats, what outside issues beyond our control or within that, uh, or within that block our progress? And opportunities, are there any new frontiers that we can explore? And when you get a group together, all different thoughts, concepts, views of the world outside, the world inside, what they do, you'll be surprised what starts going up on the chart. Don't forget, post-it note paper. I don't care if you pull a million of them off and stick them in the room when you're done. And recycle it, them, of course. Yeah, of, of course, when you're done, <laughs> yeah. You can take pictures of them after. No whiteboarding. It's got to be on paper. So the, the leader ultimate leader who is going to own and assign can can have them stuck all over the wall and let that be his accountability piece every day and every time he looks at it to say we've got to get these going so let me let me go around the room here greg i'll i'll let you start out with the last word mm. um this has been a phenomenal uh discussion and i think we could probably go on all day because each one of those things uh you know each department in our business uh, deserves that kind of attention. Right. Uh, but we're doing kind of a mini uh, ratchet wrench kind of conference within our own organization. You know, we're, we're pulling out the shop foreman, we're pulling out the managers in December. 
working on our budgets, our strategic plan for next year. And um, this is definitely something I'm going to add to the list and get out of the way, like you said, because uh, before before you and I talked, I would have been the one, like you said, uh, putting it together. And so I'm changing my uh, strategy here and I'm going to sit in the back of the room. And I've got clients that um, are asking for this kind of thing and yeah. being that third party to say, OK, let's let's take a realistic look at what you have and where you need to go, especially if you want to go multi-story because, um, you know, a big threat in that is you run out of, you run out of capital before you start making a profit. So, um, the, the, the better prepared you can go in, the more chances of success you're going to have. Mm -hmm. And so let's, let's really know what we're getting into before we just do what I did and jump in the deep end. Um, you know, I think I talked to, when you interviewed me, my story, my second shop, there's no way I would ever recommend anybody do it the way I did it. Yeah, um, yeah, so yeah. Learn, from, learn from our mistakes. Greg Bunch, go, go listen to that interview. There's a very humbling story. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, for being here. And Marianne, I'll let you go next. So it's a, it's a tool. A SWOT analysis is a tool, and it is, there's so much that you can do with it. It's not as complicated as it seems. Once you start going with it, so many light bulb moments will happen and I think it's a great tool to build culture you know in your team as well but the important part of it is once you have all these great ideas going and you have um, <laughs> implement definitely implement take action and have accountability set up some goals so that it's not just a bunch of ideas I think that a business we do a manually but I think looking back in the early days, what I would have liked to have done, because I wasn't doing this in the early days, what I think uh, twice a year would probably be good, and, and keep it, and then compare it to the next one that you do to see, because mm -hmm. I think that's really good. team see their wins and see their accomplishments builds momentum. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, back when I was in the corporate world, we did a strategic plan, a five-year strategic plan, renewable every three. So you were always looking out and then backing up and then looking out and then backing up. And in your case, a much smaller business, uh, probably more nimble and quicker on your feet. It's not bad to have a year-long strategic plan evolved from your SWOT that is renewable every six right. or seven months. Great concept. Thank you for that. And before I go to Murray. At Jasper Engines and Transmissions, quality and customer service is their number one goal. Their associates take pride in their work, and it shows in the quality drivetrain products they produce. Their quality and customer service has got them growing for 75 years. Well, thanks for putting up with my conference voice. Uh -huh. And um, Murray, you've got the last word. Oh my goodness! My no wife's going to be man. laughing. My wife's going to be brother. laughing if she sees this. No pressure. <laughs> I'm on the road. I get the last word. Um, I know that we use acronyms as coaches and trainers, and I think sometimes my clients just roll their eyes um, <laughs> at at that. I've actually created another acronym called SOAR, and it really ties into what we're talking about. And I read a, a, a sentence somewhere. And I wish I could remember the guy. To give him credit to. He says, "You cannot." plan results you can only plan actions mm. and so my acronym soar is s is what is the situation and which is what we're doing right what is the situation let's face it what are the facts let's, let's just try and leave the emotion out let's just face what's there um, then look at it what is the outcome that i would want actually not pie in the sky but what would be the outcome that i would want out of this situation and then uh what are the actions that i need to this is what marianne said what are the actions that i need to do to get the outcome that I want. And then the last one is, is what are the results that I measure it and you just completely cycle through that acronym. So uh, one more little tool to think about, you cannot plan results. We keep putting numbers on a board. You cannot reach a number without behavior, right? Mariana, right. without implementation of that process. So that's my whole goal with the clients that I work with and myself personally is, is uh, one of the uh, uh, things that I focus on. And just to you know, remind myself, Marianne, what you said about uh, celebrating the wins. Um, my personality is always looking forward. There's always another way, a better way, another solution. I don't celebrate 
my, you know, I don't look back myself of me, my kids and my wife, you know, sometimes have to remind me. And my group members sometimes say, Murray, for goodness sakes, look at what we've accomplished. I'm like, yeah, good. Okay, what's next? <laughs> what's next, right? So, you know, Marianne, thank you for that reminder right. of celebrating uh, our wins. Wonderful. Great. For more on Greg and Murray and Marianne, just search the website and listen to their episodes because you, you did terrific. And when you go to the show notes for this episode on my website, a link to the episodes that you've been in will be there. Thank you all so much. Greg Bunch, Murray Voth, Marianne Croce. Thank you. Have Carl. a Thank great you. weekend. Thank everyone. you. Thank great you. Great stuff. Great stuff. You too, guys. Thank you. Bye. 